Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, and thank you for being here at the nap time. I don't like to talk about me too much. If you want to know what I've been doing, where I work, or what projects I'm involved in, Crypto Red with Jorge Manolo. So there you have contact details. The talk is a bit peculiar, I have to say. I'm very grateful to the organizers. In principle, I was going to talk for half an hour, but it's now been extended to an hour. If you get bored, just say so. And it might sound a bit strange. I'll be talking about brain waves, and you might be wondering what the hell does this have to do with cybersecurity? I'll do my best to try and explain it. But anyway, I do, I've done my best to try and deliver a more original talk. I'm hoping that none of you knows about this. Based on an investigation carried out by a friend of mine, Alejandro, and reading a couple of uh, headlines, I've tried to do my own investigation on authentication using brainwaves, so that we can talk about both worlds, brainwaves and cybersecurity. Some things are a bit academic by nature, but they're being explained in a very pedagogic way, so hopefully it will be clear enough. We'll see whether brainwaves allow for authentication, whether they can replace uh, conventional cryptographic code, and other things. Another goal in my talk is to encourage everyone in this room to start playing around with little gadgets like these ones. These things allow us, allow us to uh, know about our brainwaves. I'm sure that some of you may have been playing around with these. Disclaimers, I'll be talking about the brain, neuroscience, I'm not an expert. I don't even come close to being an expert, so I'm humble, I'm critical in my approach, and I work, work, work. And then, the hacker mindset. I think we really need to do our best to go beyond our limits. And the essence of our mindset, helping people. Why do I say helping? Well, because these gadgets are obviously focused on cybersecurity, but they have a very strong connection with accessibility. These are little things that we used to do uh, many years ago with the remote control for the Wii console. Things that could be used by uh, disabled people. So these little devices are very useful. I'm sure you can come up with ideas of your own. So, let's go straight into the subject matter. I'll be talking about neuroscience. And since everything I know about neuroscience is the last three months, I'll be very quick. We all have a brain, whether we use it or not. Throughout the talk, I'll be talking about, about this as if we were doing an audit of the brain, a black box audit. The brain is a very complex system. But we do have an API to go into the brain. We can send stimuli to the brain and then read responses from the brain to those stimuli. And based on that, those properties, without being experts in the field, we will be able to play around with the brain in a limited way. As you know, there are lobes, different lobes in the brain which are activated depending on the activity we are applying on these lobes. If we smell on one lobe is activated and so on and so on. As my initial purpose is for, for me to make a very practical discussion on uh, how we can read through these uh, um, things. We, we, uh, consists of invasive and non-invasive methods to read the, the brain waves. We will be focused on non-invasive waves. Uh, trepanation, uh, making a hole in the, in, the, in the skull would not be advisable. But the, uh, of course, invasive methods are really passionate. Those invasive methods uh, drilling in and uh, uh, read your uh, brain waves. Precisely, the good uh, the good ones are those I'm offering you to help people to for, for blind to see for lame people to walk oh as almost being a god you can uh, see there are so many ethical and ontological issues concerning these issues the superman and uh, uh, there are uh, 
secret related issues uh, about c mental control and the classified issues which are not really invasive methods as to trepanate your uh, your brain with health and so on. Uh, I will leave it this for the next uh, discussion. Let's move on, on to the non-invasive methods. I will be speaking about uh, mechanisms to read the electroencephalogram. Uh, there are other methods as uh, rated as functional magnetic resonance imaging methods near infrared spectroscopy. I will be talking about ECG, electroencephalography methods. These um, kind of um, sensors that, that they put around, they measure and gauge different of potential. The electrical current, theoretically speaking, uh, the electrical uh, the current which is produced in theory when there is communication between levels. This is a typical example to monitor uh, the sleep disorders within critical environments, especially applied to mental diseases. Then the ABC for this uh, technology, as you can see on the screen, let's put on some sensors to gauge brain waves, because the classical ones are, as you may know, delta, theta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. Different brain waves in our, inside our head, depending on the amplitude and frequency of these waves, depend, it will be triggering one or the other. Depending on what we're doing is associated or linked with uh, a certain uh, brain wave, for and on, as you can see on screen, the beta wave, we are doing concentration, attention, processes, beta will be triggered. So uh, I want to remark that for me to gauge this kind of brain wave is such a complex issue because being low frequency waves are micro volts. So I need very precise technology to filter out uh, the, the signaling and the background noise as to, it's difficult to, to it's like hearing a conversation in the middle of a, the, the, the soccer pitch. It's complicated, but more and more low cost devices are created recently and is interesting, interesting for, for us to see. Beside the brain waves, especially in the final stage, when we will we'll, uh, be coping with mental surveillance, which is a tax on mind to strike and drill out uh, secrets from our mind. I, I think it sounds like science fiction, but in the last final stage, I will talk about the ERP, even related potential when your brain receives a stimulus, auditive or visual uh, stimuli, certain patterns are, are reproduced during a certain period of time, and depending on analyzing these patterns, we can extract information. There are um, proofs that can check out this. Uh, it's kind of a scurrying theme for us to, to see, but where we can put on these sensors, there are a, a series of standards we follow that tells us that there's a, on certain areas uh, in, in our brain, it's reasonable for us to put this sensor, we can, you can read a certain activity in a specific, on a specific lobe in our, in our brain. When, I'm, when I concentrate on a task, I may want to put it on this position because uh, the sensor will be reading this activated uh, part of our brain when we are doing a specific action. The letter you can see in front of it, every, uh, this number uh, refers to the specific uh, uh, frontal occipital load. Um, oh, I'm freaking out. Temporal lobe and uh, parietal lobe and so on. So far, so good. Until three years ago, uh, the, the most of these devices <coughs> used, especially in clinical in environments, it was uh, hard, hard, very expensive, however, over 1,000 years and more. These devices could be used within uh, the military environments uh, and especially mental surveillance. This um, uh, devices, as you can see on screen, are, um, are very useful. Uh, Low-cost devices are better for us, around ranging from, you can see on the screen, 100 to 400 euros, depending on their position. Over the, the past three years, the f most famous one had been the nearest kind of my own wave from 79 euros, and Epoch emoted from uh, um, nearest kind of Near sky has one single sensor and reader, and depending on the and epoch, 
has around uh, 14 sensors. We can read uh, more uh, precisely certain um, things depending on our expectations and other devices as well. Besides that, if you're, I, if you're encouraged to do so, I'll leave you on screen some links about the, the libraries that are programming these devices. A lot of reverse engineering has been done for the protocols on Python. You can try it with uh, Arduino. You can even uh, design your own uh, de devices, uh, especially applicable to mental surveillance. You can create a specific hardware to put it on these areas. Um, signal in my head and you can improve a lot. There's so much information available and it's hackable information uh, that which not belong to laboratory environments anymore. We can see now on the screen an example. Then, then I will show you a demo. This is the a new Sky Mineware device. I bought it myself. I paid for it, period. Uh, you can get it from, from through Amazon. Uh, cost it uh, uh, 120 euros. It, this device has one uh, single sensor on the frontal lobe CPU area. Uh, its features allows us to to to, to monitor in three to three to uh, 100 hertz frequency rates and the the, the um, brain waves I show you previously, and the sampling patterns as well. We are running out of time, so there's no mysterious things on this image. Like you can see, you can put the diam around your head. You can see how your ring waves work. One of the interesting and good things for the epoch and this uh, kind of crown, they are developing complex algorithms as to obtaining uh, more data from the electronics. These um, uh, kind of FTP um, electrode can uh, read your level of meditation and concentration with two levels, with the next option being on the frontal lobe when you are um, really twinkling your eye and blinking your eye. You can precisely uh, measure what's going on with your uh, blinking eye. I'm playing around with meditation and um, concentration. I can create binary assist. I can control more things. I, I can switch on and switch off. I, get, I can turn on and turn off so I can do whatever I like. I'll show you an example on Java with different demos. You can do on Python. Uh, I don't use any kind of uh, library because if you download the uh, information, you do some reverse, you, know, you can get uh, how you can use it. it this is a skeleton of the Java program when you can uh, read the information when you are blinking your eye, the level of meditation, the attention level, different brain waves. With, you can, this can be implemented, you can play around with it, whatever you like it. Uh, for you to understand the impact of this kind of technology, I uh, will do something I like, which is um, playing a game in front of 1,000 people. So this is my demo for you, my friends. Me pongo la diadema. Pero no tiene mis. I get this electrode. It's a dry electrode. You don't need to. You don't need any kind of gel or lubricant. Period. This is a simple electrode. No duplicado. I didn't duplicate it. I didn't. Am I correct? Playing demo time. I didn't prepare a specific video, so some, if something uh, is wrong, I'll try to fix it uh, on the go. This is a very sim simple uh, game. I don't want to lose my time, but this is quite a significant game. Exemplary game. So let's see. Let's move on the right. How can I do? You can see a bar which reads concentration. Concentrated ones of the labs, it, it, it gauges your level of concentration. This is any kind of, um, again, many people are developing. You can see, I can do actions with my mind here. I, I will take a magnet. I will select the uh, car if I'm getting concentrated. 
uh, you can see what I'm doing with my brain waves. In on at home, I did the five multiplication table with my mind. It's getting up. It's getting up. It's getting up. It's going up. Now it's going down. So if we are uh, applauding me for this, my goodness. Another example of meditation. It's easier for me to control med meditation rather than concentration. When I get on, when I get in the car, I concentrate myself. I use my respiration. If it's getting up and going out, please uh, tell me. I stop being concentrated, and so you can interact with things with your mind. This is a kind of uh, Kaliburuka Basque uh, revolution. I try to concentrate on the beam. Oh, it's, it's fucking doing this in front of 1,000 people, my goodness. At a certain moment in time, in time this will burst out and explode. Um, this is a silly example of the video game. I wanted to show you because I want I want to see how this impact uh, the big game industry. This will make um, this device be in our everyday lives with security implications that we'll see in the very end of my presentation. I'll leave it there, and we keep moving forward. Near Skype. This kind of device is not only used for playing, but is likely to be used in the, in the next years only for a, a game. You can see on screen a long list of things that you can do. Then we'll see practical cases, images. One of the questions I posed myself, if it was if one of these uh, devices are really secure and safe. Part of the, my, my answer was given by Al Alejandro and artists. Uh, um, device is able to establish some kind of uh, security. These are real experiments uh, from a, a laboratory transmitting Im information from one mind to another. These are such a complex systems which activates the, the brain in different ways. Microsoft is preventing software glitches by keeping track of obvious programs, brain ways to make people more productive. This is less interesting for me. Brain control drone shown off by Tebaker. You can move things with your mind. You can um, buy games and toys from Amazon online. This application is very useful in the military environments, especially in the United States. They are investing a lot of money to um, automatize uh, commands, especially for intelligence analysts to detect threats as soon as possible. They are in, in researching a lot. There are so many devices to, cheaper than the previous, uh, at, the, at, the, at the cost of 70 years to check out and engage uh, how how concentrated you can be. Uh, we human beings, of course, uh, somebody will make up of our uh, technology. It can be used in sentencing hearings to extract details. Brain scan delays sentencing hearing for convicted murdering in Brooksville. You can st stimulate somebody criminal's mind in order to see how the, the potential crooked guy is reacting. Even if you can find uh, this, uh, have one that you may like it, of course, if you, ha if you have compatible brain waves, love will flow. So um, Japanese people with so many vices, you may be happy or angry, so your your tail will uh, tickling and agitating. So it's useful for any kind of uh, cars, Jaguars. One of the very first uses was for disabled people on wheelchairs. People tr who, who tries to simplify this with cheaper devices. This is an epoch. Uh, you drive a car, so certain activities with your mental, mental control. I love this one. Uh, this is neuromarketing. You go to, to a shop and 
to buy a shirt, they put a, an electrode like this, and the system will recommend a shirt to you. How did you guess that? How do you know this? The electrode um, gauges that, that, that you are stressed, depending on the algorithms, the, the electro things, that uh, the red shirt is the best one. I fucking shit, the red shirt. You got home, but uh, the shop uh, sold it to you, but in the brain you lost. This is the, the simplest electrode. You can do the binary system with domotics, uh, uh, drawing up and down the, the blind. This is um, the optogenetics, which means that you are able to um, uh, introduce false or good uh, memories in your mind. If you, we are that 3D printed uh, uh, printers, uh, for disabled people, oh, you can get the health benefit from that. Now this article on screen, in the real life, these kind of news are like a novelty over the past years, but when something new goes to the, the, the whole humanity, we find out that this has been uh, something they did back in time. In the 70s, they, invest, they investigated on this technology. Please check out the, the link I'm leaving here about the very good things they are um, publishing and they are uh, research and publish. It strikes my attention, their interest about using these for intelligence analysis. We They use uh, the brain to filter out um, common repetitive patterns. I'm passionate about the uh, integral uh, learning. I stimulate a device and I get an answer back from the brain to adapt my brain to understanding the information ob obtained more quickly. So interesting information can be learned so quickly by my brain following this way and to in invest my money. Am I going very quickly? Uh, I'm doing very good on time. I'm doing fine on time. Short basic, short basic introduction about what this kind of devices are as of today. In the next coming minutes, I want to talk about um, security. Security in electroencephalography. They are not designed, these devices are not designed to be secure and safe. Alejandro gave a, a presentation in a different place. Alejandro said to us, he remarks, remarked, this kind of devices um, are, are doing good in reading the brain waves, but they don't implement any security mechanisms. They can read your brain waves, it's super good, but in the very end, this will be translated into bits and it has to be transmitted in such a way. If the communication is not well protected, you can be replayed, you can um, re receive denial of a service, uh, attacks. Uh, Man to replay. This is working on um, Wi-Fi, on um, no authentication, no nothing. Uh, a citation that struck my mind from Alejandro version said that people non-authorized can read your brain activity. They, he didn't refer to the this devices, but to the transmission, and they can falsify your brain waves which means that it was clear that among many things because um, we needed authentication, cryptography. I uh, wonder myself, with the very same device with our mind, can we do this? Can we authenticate ourselves with some mental process? Can we create a cryptographic or random number password? And uh, I will show you what even though it's still in diapers, what we have done so far. I will tell you some details. I will um, remark the, the problems for the virtues will use the authors. So I will try to demystify what we can do with brain waves in authentication. Authentication based on mine, this comes from articles dated back to 2004 in which they said so many interesting things. Uh, past thoughts, the future of authentication. Is it time to replace passwords with past thoughts? Past thoughts, brain-based passwords, a reality, your brain pattern, authentication based on mine, your brain to replace uh, passwords. The problem is the passwords. 
uh, we had been uh, creating super cool technological base password because people want to sell technology is good but regardless of technologies just to create passwords and the counter measures we're using for making uh, more secure passwords there are so many mechanisms to make a secure password there are two uh, tax difficult to, to be tackled with which is the the, crypt the the black bag crypto analysis and Robert Hose you are forced to read a password whether you like it or not or you can be uh, stolen from this uh, passwords it's in torture and coercion to extract the password by force or by law what can we do with these devices in order to authenticate we can the things we can do fun things but not not profitable or useful we'll show you a demo este este esta diadema permite detectar el this this electrode allows us to perceive how we can move our eyelashes eyelashes move up up and down this electrode allows us i don't know if this is going to work so basically speaking this is I'm now moving my eyelashes very quickly, lashing up and down. With your eyelash movement, you can direct the, uh, the movement of the letters. This way, a guy behind your bag won't be able to copy and detect the password you're using. I can see this, there is limited uh, practical usage for that. But there are people in this life with so much free time that they, they can devote their free time to do this. To do this. In fact, in, in accordance with these authors, this investigation, this research is done with this electrode and reach a ratio of 99%. That's, it's tricky, uh, but they did it with 10 family members out there, so they thin. So the, their validity is quite relative. You can see the date it dates back to 2015. The, the fact of moving up and down your eyelashes done a long time ago with sophisticated sophisticated techniques only with a um, 100 de device you can measure uh, the eyelash movements now regarding the separation of time in during the, the mental process just in authentication time is a factor realm factor theoretically speaking what would the mind be good regarding establishing an authentication method Theoretically speaking, if I create a password based upon a thought, nobody behind my back would be able to see the password I'm pressing down. A password based upon thoughts has not necessary to be secret. I can base my password in reciting in my mind a certain type of uh, song no, nobody will know about because my opponent, my attacker, should be reciting in their own mind the, the very same scene, but he doesn't know that I'm reciting a song. I leave it over there because our, these, these the topics are still uh, immature. I said that we cannot copy and replicate mental process, but if you are copy, you can resort to another biometric mechanism. If your uh, 10 uh, fingers have been cut off, you should have chosen another mechanism. You can, we can also do continuous authentication, especially when it comes to a continuous testing. It would be a good idea for you to have something that can authenticate you. I can only see malign usefulness. This, this only works if you are alive. I'm talking about malign activity because I'm thinking of systems. Should I be uh, deaf? Uh, should I be killed? Um, I should need extra system. This is the two-factor authentication, the 2FA, uh, an inheritance factor, brain, and a knowledge factor, a chosen password. And another thing is the plausible deniability, depending on how your brain works. If somebody uh, forces you to give you a password, you uh, get it stressed out and you generate the very same brain waves and the authentication system won't be working. Somebody forces you to give you uh, a password. This is not going to work because you're stressed out. Uh, 
if, if the self capacity of stress now um, doesn't work, you can resort to plausible deniability. It does not work because it's like this, but you are provoking the situation with your brain. Every human brain generates specific patterns, uniquely pa unique, unique patterns. As any other security of thinking of uh, pat patterns, uh, it needs uh, features as to reading mental uh, features in our mind universally. So there are so many things I put into doubt. This authentication process should be continuous in time, should be um, secure, not non-attackable, and people should be using this the distinctive collectible and unique process. I will sum up in just uh, one or two slides, 60 articles I read about authentication with your mind. This is not a mystery at all. The scheme on screen, the outline is applies to how the authentication system uh, in the mind works. We have um, a device which captures brain waves through different mathematical procedures. These characteristics in the brain, you th think about a mental task. This device analyzes the brain waves and extracts um, from that certain characteristics as our brain does not react in the very same way re regarding uh, stimuli. These characteristics will change, so I will need the classification algorithm as to create in groups. Once I get the classification, I extract uh, small information, and that's the way I can authenticate some person. Uh, there is a training phase. I generate some values. When I move to authenticate, I repeat it, and I compare it with previous sampling. You can have uh, different matching learning uh, algorithms and mathematical techniques. The base of all of that is for us to conduct mental tax in our brains. In our brain. What would uh, a mental tax be? Uh, shut, down, shut down the eyes, it would generate mental activity uh, to receive um, visual audio stimuli, uh, concentrate your mind by moving one finger, text through the objects, visual, evoke potential, beep, uh, P300, even rate potential. Uh, my key, for instance, is elephant. I think of an elephant based upon a thought. So I will uh, conduct this kind of mental uh, actions and the authentication system will be working. So let's move on to problems. What are the articles published around this? Because they, it has characteristics that would make it uh, interesting for all of us. Uh, almost all the articles I saw, and I say um, articles because I don't know any commercial system doing this. If you know of any of these commercial systems, please let me know. And the very truth is that m part of the uh, devices have been placed have been done with multi-sensor devices, with expensive multi-sensor devices over uh, one thousand. Uh, which this implies and triggers cost related and stability issues and this won't be used on authentication process you have so many articles on screen I don't want you to get your slip um, so many articles so the good thing about the, the latest discoveries and findings over the past years had been replicated with the emotive with this in the, with the cheapest one um, cost uh, 400 euros. I will show you now uh, with uh, devices valued and worth of 400 euros. Uh, this example is uh, kind of uh, questionable because it has less precision. You, you can get bored about so many articles on screen. Uh, what are this system of, of authentication based on. You can diagnose mental activity, as I said, and they process uh, typically these, the alpha, beta, gamma, uh, pattern uh, 300 uh, waves, which uh, reads meditation, attention, concentration, when your brain is active, not when you are asleep, not in the profound uh, relaxation. Problems common to all the systems. The question of time. For a user to uh, register in a system, you need 30 to 40 minutes. There is a learning curve. The software has to recognize how the uh, 
uh, user behaves. And then, once the system has learned, authentication takes between 5 and 30 seconds. In certain environments, that may be reasonable. In some of this, it may be too long. And amongst the most severe problems encountered by this type of research is that the sample groups are very small. There's very few people involved. I'm talking about groups of three up to 20-something people. In other studies, they analyze more examples by using medical databases. They would gather information on theta waves from people suffering from epilepsy and then analyze the data. But this is like comparing legitimate uses with people suffering from epilepsy. It's very strange. Anyway, the accuracy of the systems is very high. In most of these studies, we're talking about 80 to 90 percent accuracy, so that they may be compared to other mechanisms, conventional biometric mechanisms, if you like. And then there is the issue of cost. Problems they still have. On the one hand, the problem of stability and reproducibility, the possibility to replicate the process in more than one location. As it seems, and I didn't know about this before, if you carry out a mental task, if you think about a greenhouse, for example, the results should be more or less similar with time. But as it happens, things are not that stable. It seems that aging, or time itself, has an impact on your mental processes. There's a number of articles out there, I haven't found too many, which say that in the best possible situation, one specific mental task could be uh, perceived in the same way for up to six months, maximum. After that, you would need to authenticate yourself against the system, again. It may not sound as a very uh, important concern because at the end of the day with conventional systems you change your passwords every six to nine months. But with these systems, it shouldn't be necessary to do such thing. Okay? Another important problem is that our brain is affected by emotions, by stress, by happiness, by joy, by fear, that you could find yourself in a situation as funny as this one. Do you go to work from home, you've had a, an argument with your girlfriend, and you're stressed, so you cannot authenticate against the system, you cannot log on. So, some things remain unclear. It may be very accurate, but other things are still unclear. Too unclear to make it a feasible system in the short term. This is a more uh, detailed slide on uh, a study that was used, uh, that was conducted using this device. This is from 2003. Most of the articles that you can read in the press on authentication are based on this study. How does it work? Well, these are the details. Again, a sample, a very small sample with uh, very few subjects, so its validity is limited. There are sessions of up to 50 minutes for several days so that they are trained properly. And then they are allocated different tasks. For example, the breathing task, the simulated finger movement, the sports task, and so on and so forth. After completion of those tasks, you measure alpha and beta waves with this device. For each frequency, you get to add an average value. And with those average values, you establish a comparison with previous readings. As simple as that, there's nothing else to it really. What are the results of this study? As you can see here, if you can read through this, if we were, use, if we were focusing on a task, focusing on, on thought, thought processes, 0% of non-legitimate users would get into the system. Whereas 12% of legitimate users will be reject would be rejected by the system. There are values that move up and down depending on what we establish as a comparison, and some might be reasonable. I'm mentioning the one focusing on thought processes because this is the one that hit the headlines. 
The cool thing about this is that this is heavily focused on the usability and the security of this study. Almost none of the studies I've seen before focused on usability. This could be one of the safest, and yet it is one of the uh, most uncommon. So people are using, authors are using uh, less safe procedures more often. Again, remember that in this study there is no analysis of the length of time that is needed to make all tasks uh, useful. This is about basic authentication when the user is an active part of the system. There are other uh, research projects focused on implicit learning. I've only found this one, but it's really cool. This is one user. You ask the user to perform a certain process. They don't need to know what this is for. In this case, this is a game. And implicitly, the uh, user learns a key, learns a password. They're not aware of that, but their brain is. With that information stored in the brain, they then log into the system. Just like a Tetris game. The experiment shows you um, little balls at different speeds, slowly, fast, and users remain there for, for some time. How do they log in? Well, it's five minutes. So you can imagine. The interesting thing is that during the, those five minutes, there is a, a reduced version of the game with a number of patterns that have, have been carefully studied beforehand. And at the end of that five minute period, the system knows that they have a legitimate user trying to log in. It's like having, this is equivalent to having a 38-bit key. If you push the user into uh, making them tell you what the keyword is, they will not be able to do that because it's un unconscious. Quite interesting. It leads to other things like science fiction. Uh, experiments that have to do with establishing the brain as a gateway to other things and well, we will not go into that, not enough time. So far so, go so good about authentication. Let me tell you about generating keys with the mind and random numbers. Am I doing well with time? Okay. So it's obviously an interesting thing to uh, use the brain for authentication. How about using the brain to generate keys? Well, everything I've found is focused on encoding the result of brain waves, especially in medical environments for data privacy purposes. I've only found one study. It is true that authentication systems might be adapted. How does this work? How does the algorithm work? Just imagine that we have a text with information of any type encoded into a binary tree. As you know, we have a, co a correspondence for each letter, a one or a zero. The uh, cryptographic key will be the zero or the one for each branch. So here we assign a cryptographic key to the branch. Zero, zero, one means that it goes through this branch and that branch. So the, the good thing is to be able to generate the, crypto, the cryptographic key. The sample was 10 subjects using one of the expensive gadgets, 61 sensors in this case, measuring activity quite well. Visual stimuli are presented with further analysis of the gamma waves. They measure statistical patterns and classification patterns and they reach their conclusions. With the measure they uh, take, the measurement they take of the gamma waves, if they go above a certain threshold value, that means that they have a bit one key. If they are under that threshold, is a bit zero key, thereby generating the, crypt the cryptographic key. What is the main limitation here? Well, to me, this is really useful. Just imagine that you have a volume that has been encoded. The problem is that you might have authentication uh, problems that were not there if the user is stressed. Here we have the problems of authentication with biometrics.
sometimes the user knowing how to generate the key will not be able to decode the information whereas in other scenarios there will be users who will be able to get into the system without knowing the key I'm not too sure that people will be willing to go this way I mean if you're at home you might have the right environment but in general environments I don't think this would be suitable Obviously, and just to speed things up because I'm running out of time, perhaps we cannot generate a cryptographic key as such, but we can certain gen certainly generate a random number and use it for other purposes. Let me show you um, a little demo. We made a study a few years ago using the remote control of the Wii console, but we don't have that much time. So let me show you something. That's more demo. Can you see it? second right there it goes in fact I'm not sure it connected properly yeah well this is just a small example a small silly example what I'm doing now is reading my brain waves I'm reading my level of attention and what happens when I blink my eye, what happens if I focus on something. So I'm monitoring my brain activity and that generates information. How about using this as a, a generator of random numbers for simple or complex things? It could be a good idea. Perhaps it's only that, a good idea. because if then you apply a, a basic statistical analysis to see whether these ideas could be useful for cryptography, results are not that promising. Well, let me speed up. These are uh, dots, a dot chart of my mental processes over 10 hours in the, in the uh, last three months, watching videos and reading books and things. And since this was um, random figures, I applied filters to show it graphically. We can see the raw material. But since it was a nuisance having the device on my uh, skull all the time, I decided to use it without my head. So it seems that brainwave samples can be obtained without the brain. If you look at the raw data, it seems that it might make sense. But then if you take it seriously, as you can imagine, if you perform statistical attacks, this has to be rejected. This is useless for everything, not even for random numbers. But obviously you can use the brain as an entropy source. In Linux we may use these, uh, key, the uh, mouse or the keyboard for small uh, amounts of information. It may sound strange, but the brain could be used. There's very little uh, research in uh, random numbers generated by the brain. This is quite striking. This is a guy that says that brain waves generate uh, random numbers. But again, this only happens with uh, epileptic patients. This has been conducted with medical data, so I think it's very strange. Using epileptic patients to protect systems doesn't make sense in my mind. And another one which is similar to what I did myself using Epoch, the conclusion was similar. If you take the information straight from the device, the numbers coming from the device are not random, but if you apply a little mathematical wizardly, you could use them. You could use them. And since I didn't want to uh, stop there on authentication and encoding, let me finish off by telling you about a number of attacks that can be uh, performed on the human brain. Why this type of attacks in the first place? Well, I'm thinking about using this for critical uh, elements, but perhaps there are attacks out there that could, could extract information from my mental processes. So I browsed the web to see what I could find. There's uh, journalists and researchers that say that this will become a reality by the year 2030, but since I don't like being dominated by robots, I wanted to find out by myself. As you know, most of us use gadgets 
If those gadgets could be hacked, that, would, that could lead to major problems. You know, the Samsung watch that could be hacked to obtain information about what the fingers are doing, what keys they're pressing. Let us talk about privacy, thought privacy. The part of forensics, an area of forensics, which, we, which is called brain fingerprinting. There's different ways to use it. But one of the basic ones uses pattern P300. This is a wave produced by the brain when a person gets a certain stimulus, a visual stimulus, for example. Uh, around 300 milliseconds down the, down the road, a certain wave is produced with a certain peak value. By analyzing the peak value, you may determine whether the user knows about the information. This has been used in identification rounds. For example, the uh, suspect is taken to the uh, police station and this technique is there. Obviously, additional applications could uh, be found. Some companies say that this might be the solution to many things. When people claim that is usually a lie. Anyway, I mean, and I've been reading through headlines. Is it feasible? Well, relatively. If we get into military documents, you can imagine. This is from 2001. They've been talking about this for years on end. These are letters exchanged between the FBI and certain institutions in the US. But it is true that there are some people out there using Epoch to try and capture that time of brain waves, P300, to obtain information from the brain. Is this real? Well, it is. In fact, let me show you two attacks. And with that, I will be done. Obviously, they have their own limitations, but uh, let me show you. The two uh, studies were conducted by the same authors from very well-known universities like Oxford and Berkeley. What they wanted to prove was the fact that this type of devices, especially in gaming environments, are dangerous for privacy. What proof of concept did they have? Well, they used Epoch and Motif. You may download applications for Android that can allow you to interact with your brain waves. And in, in, in these studies, they had different scenarios with different stimuli where they measured the P300 pattern. With that information, they may determine the area where you live they may know things about your credit card, they may know things like your age. Well, if we have time, I'll sh if we had time, I will show you the experiments in detail. But there's one more problem now in our world of IoT, which is brain, brain spyware. They can develop malware for our brains. This is a study where the sample had 20 people and uh, the results range from 20 to 60 percent in the best possible scenario they would get information private information from 60 percent of people for example they were playing a game they would show a stimulus to them like uh, Obama's face is a new Obama's face well everyone knows Obama but by showing them different stimuli, they will get information, private information from those uh, subjects. Hiding this is more difficult. So they went for the subliminal option, performing the same attacks, but stimuli were delivered in less than 14 milliseconds. So you're not visually aware of those stimuli, although your brain is. This was performed using a more complex type of device with uh, accuracy going up to 70% uh, or even more. Accuracy goes up significantly. I think this is a, a clear and obvious danger, a clear risk. We'll see prices going down. So I think we have to be uh, aware of this, especially when talking about games, video games. My main conclusions.
If you didn't know about this, I just wanted to make it clear that those devices that allow us to measure our own brain waves may be very useful for different things. It is useful to know that there are applications out there that can be that are commercially available. And in short, this is a really exciting world where we can research, where we can investigate. It's like someone thinking about the word hello and someone else, somewhere else, finding out that the first person was, was thinking hello. It was two bits per minute. That was the current rate of uh, communication. Obviously, with these devices, we need to have security in mind when storing, when communicating, when connecting. And if we think about using these devices for something else, for authentication, for cryptography, for random number generation, we really need to be cautious. They're very exciting, but we need to pay attention to the risks we're facing. This has been used for small people, groups of people, like 10, 20, 30 people. It might work. Something I wasn't expecting is that there is a real problem with privacy with these devices. This thing that I have at home can be hacked by someone. Someone can develop an application in Android, send stimuli to my brain, and then retrieve information from my brain, private information. It might work. It might sound like science fiction, but really, we need to pay attention to this. Think about firewall technology for the brain. IDS firewall techniques. As they say at the NSA, attacks always get better. They never get worse. Little else for me, what I will try to do in the future, if I have enough time, is to build my own device to analyze that P300, which is around this area of the brain. And I will be focusing on cryptography because that's the interesting part for me. I'm passionate about this together with neurofeedback. I mean, measuring your brain activity and improving your health one way or another. Accelerated learning, when learning languages and things, this is a dream for lots of people. And attacks. That's where these technologies will focus. We'll see quite a few talks about attacks based on these devices. So the ball is on your court. The potential is huge. If you want to play around, it's up to you. Lots of references. My acknowledgements to lots of people that directly and indirectly helped me put together this uh, presentation. That was it for me. Una pregunta. One question. Let me show you something once you think about it. Perhaps I know, I don't know the answer. Hello and congratulations for your talk. It was very interesting. You said that authentication with these devices is equivalent to a password with 38 characters. Am I right? 38 bit. But that is the mechanism, the, the implicit mechanism. The explicit one, it doesn't make any difference. To what extent do you have to be in a certain very special environment, in a very special state, so that the signal you send allows you to authenticate yourself? Or do you have a margin of variation, if you like? What I was trying to explain during that on that slide is that Authentication systems are trained when the users are very calm. If you're stressed, it is very likely that you will not be able to log in. And then there are other studies that uh, uh, expect users to be in altered states. But you need to have a stressful argument with your boss beforehand. This is just a, a very simple application. Here you see the waves in real time. If I focus on something, attention levels go up. Yeah, I went up in meditation. My mind doesn't give anything else. Thank you.